Hey everyone, this is Josh coming to you from the editing room, and I just need to say up top that I am sorry, I forgot to mention that Alex and I were recently on an episode of I Have Some Notes, where we talked about Ant-Man and the Wasp Mania. That will be in the episode description, so as soon as you're done listening to us talking about the superb owl trailers, head on over and give Greg, Liam, and Scott a listen, because it's a fun time, they're great dudes, and they need more listens, so head on over, the episode link is in the description, see you soon. Welcome to T-Smack, home of the T-Smack. May I take your order? Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Talking Smack, where we talk superheroes, movies, animation, comics, and much, much more. I'm your host, Josh Scar, and joining me as always is... Ah. this is why we don't record during the day he found some sunlight and now he's taking a nap alex alex (laughs) alex (laughs) what what (laughs) we're we're supposed to be doing a podcast no 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 i told you to shut your curtains so there was no sunlight no listen i was out late tay tay had a win with kc and i had to go do something with the 49ers it's a bad night for me yeah, I'm no, you're a cat and you had a sunbeam. You just can't resist. Leave me alone. I'm tired. <laughs> you're a cat. You're always tired. That's true. <laughs> but joining me as always is our my co-host, Alex. Alex, how you doing? I am doing fantastic. Uh, I went to a friend's house to observe the superb owl and discovered something I didn't know about myself. It turns out that I can find men running into each other for four hours. Boring. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it got really exciting towards the end of there. So we are here to talk about the trailers that debuted, uh, more really during the week of the superb owl. Um, not necessarily during, because I think we only had two exclusives that actually debuted during the, sh- during the game. Mm-hmm. Um, Everything else was just kind of like the internet cares more about this than general audiences. So let's let the general or the the internet know more before anyone else. Uh, but before we get into that, let's hear from Josh and Amanda over at Super Familiar with the Wilsons. When we come back, we'll talk about trailers from the Super Bowl. The Super Familiar with the Wilsons podcast. You know that family whose house you hung out in when you were a kid? The house was a little loud and chaotic, but always fun and sometimes felt more home than home. Well, that's us. We're the Wilsons, and we welcome you into our podcast with silly chat, ridiculous games, and interviews with interesting people. Like a spin doctor. The super familiar with the Wilsons podcast. Welcome home. The Super Bowl. Um, (laughs) (laughs) It's not about the game. It's about the the commercials. Mm -hmm. And in this case, for us, this is kind of like the pre-Comic-Con era that we're in. Uh, every year because studios love to roll out big trailers for their upcoming movie slate. And I will say that I think this is the first year I realized that most of the big commercials tend to happen in the first half of the game. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that's because people leave at halftime. No one's interested in the halftime show anymore. So people tend to leave whatever Super Bowl party they're at. So that leads to a a big drop off in viewership and also probably people going to bed. I mean, on the East Coast, the game ended at like 11 o'clock at night on a Sunday. So people got to go to work. And I I don't know. I think it's just interesting. Uh, And I the business side of me is very curious as to like how and when people buy uh, these slots. But that's that's a different conversation for a different time. We've got a bunch of trailers for A Quiet Place, Wicked, Imaginary Friend, or If, uh, The New Planet of the Apes, and Deadpool and Wolverine, which is now officially titled Deadpool and Wolverine. Um, So we're going to get into it, just kind of our reactions to, thoughts and reactions to these trailers, and we're going to kick it off with A Quiet Place Day One. Um, Alex, I'll let you start. I was very disappointed in the, the little tease we got because the trailer was already dropped. It wasn't like an exclusive, but... I will say, still say that the way the usage of silence when you're cutting from, you know, noisy stadium and annoying announcers who obviously didn't prep because that's not what he does anymore 
to you clearly weren't watching the Nickelodeon feed. <laughs> I didn't know that was available. Calling the game. <laughs> I didn't find that out until I got home from, and it said like, oh man, the Nickelodeon feed is lit. I'm like, there was a Nickelodeon feed. <laughs> if, it, if it weren't like, I'm fine with like the bamboo overlay of the, the scoreboard and a few different things that they do on screen. But like the, the augmented reality stuff that they do um, during the game, that's a little annoying to me. Like that's a little much. I know they're trying to make it visually stimulating for kids, but football is entertaining enough as it is when the, the game is in motion. <laughs> It's still compelling. The sequel was a was a surprise, and how much they moved the plot forward, and the resolution. It you know it was. It made sense that you would have to kind of go to an area where you're finding out more about the creatures, but also like kind of take the fight to them. The kind of thing, you know, mankind will survive. But to drop back and have uh, Lupito Nyong'o and Digimon Houston. Uh, I know I pronounced his name wrong. I feel terrible. Uh, Jaiman Hinsu. Jaiman Hinsu. If I'm remembering correctly. Thank you. To have them take this, take the lead on this, just how, you know, you got that tangent of from the second one to this one, but then just Lupita is just so expressive. You know that with all the noise and chaos of what's going on, she is just going to carry this role like nothing else. I'm, I'm pretty excited for it. Yeah, and she's got a cat, so I mean, there's, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that cat's gonna be an asshole throughout the entire movie. Oh yeah, he's gonna cause so many problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, but talking about the extended trailer, not just the the Super Bowl spot that we got, which again, to your point, is uh, wonderfully done playing with the sound. Um, the the full trailer, I was pleasantly surprised by. Uh, this was not a movie that I was extraordinarily interested in. I'm like, how? Why are we interested in? the downfall of humanity from these, I call them space fleas. Um, they, I, I, my head cannon is they're just these parasitic monsters that destroy planets to the point where they eventually blow up and then they just move on to the next thing. They, uh, I'm really hoping they're not like a, a forerunner pre, uh, invasion kind of force. I'm just hoping it's a, a, a matter of chaos, but, uh, the whole, the trailer sets up enough that I'm very interested in what this story tells, especially setting it in a bustling city like New York city. Uh, The whole idea behind the first two movies is you're in these rural, you're in these rural settings that are quiet and they have this random waterfall that allows them to still speak. So it like talks about ambient noise and, what kind of ambient noise exists in a bustling city like that after an alien invasion? It's just seeing the transition from understanding or going from the way of life that we know into we need to be quiet is going to be so interesting and seeing how they, where this movie decides to end is going to be just, it's the hook of the movie for me is where we see the start of the invasion and what's going on with these monsters. Where is the natural ending point to this narrative for this prequel movie? And I, okay, I'm in. Yep. I hope this movie, since it is a prequel does answer a question I have had about the first movie for the longest time. You're in a post-apocalyptic society. Why were you not practicing safe sex? And you brought a baby into a world with, with where any sound brings these monsters. I really hope that like there's some kind of side note of like a news report of like that, you know, Emily Blunt and John Krasinski didn't get of like, oh, this latest shipment of condoms was defective or something. <laughs> to finally answer the question. I think question. you're going a little too Disney Star Wars. <laughs> um, I don't think we need to know that. I think it's just an inter- it's just something that they put into the movie that created a conflict oh. because – Labor is loud. Labor is loud. Emily Blunt sold that. I just, I if they're going to start patching holes that are in the wall, like like you said, Star Wars style. Little teaser, maybe the front page of like the New York Times for that morning of the invasion, so they didn't pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> like the She Hulk Easter egg about the uh, Eternal in the the ocean. Mm-hmm. Just just a quick little blurb, like defective comics sent out or comics condoms. <laughs> uh. I sure you can I you can have that and I'll take the rest of the movie. <laughs> I, I that's not going to break anything for me. No pun intended on the broken condoms. 
and the onus should be upon him. It's, it's not always the woman who must be on contraceptive. He needs to step up and own his own his own role here. He can go to the pharmacy and find <laughs> nothing. I mean, those are going to be like the last thing to go, exactly. really. In a post-apocalyptic world, no one wants contraceptives. They're going to be like, hell yeah, freedom. <laughs> no consequences. Oh, I got eaten because I shed a freedom. <laughs> <laughs> so josh what do you think about wicked because wicked is just like this blind spot for me of of hollywood stuff yes i know uh, adina menzel and kristen chenoweth were on it i i know defying gravity the book was the book it came uh that they formed the musical off of was huge there's a revival of it like apparently every 10 minutes or something like that on broadway but is it like a staple for you or anything? Uh, it's not a staple for me. I did see it somewhat recently. Uh, I think in 20 early 2018, late 2017, uh, I did see the stage play and I, I think it's a, a lovely show. I, it, it's kind of like frozen where I think the music, especially defying gravity, which coincidentally both originally sung by Adina Menzel kind of carries what is more or less kind of lackluster from the get-go but it's it's an interesting story and it's one that tells the the tale of the wizard of oz but what if we looked a little to the left okay and what i mean by that is we we get a prequel story to uh glinda and elphaba the wicked witch of the west having this beautiful friendship from their school days that eventually breaks because they want different things out of their professions <laughs> for lack of a better word and uh the wizard is actually just this evil man who is trying to solve a problem through means of animal cruelty which is why we get the flying monkeys and it's it's an interesting story that is a, a great twist on the the classic wizard of oz story but the the drama and everything behind it i i, I think again the music is is what carries this more than the actual story. I know there are a lot of people who are going to come at me who I will say like, it's the most beautiful story ever told. Yeah. Uh, I, but I'm, I'm here for the queer love between Glinda and Alphaba, even though they're both fighting over a dude, but the, the main relationship between Glinda and Alphaba is absolutely beautiful. It's, it's a great story of two women who are just really good friends and the music behind it is fantastic. Uh, I cannot wait to hear Ariana Grande and Cynthia uh, Erivo, I believe is how you pronounce her last name. Uh, I cannot wait for to hear their rendition of For Good. That is like Defying Gravity is the showstopper, but For Good is the emotional punching, uh, not punching bag. It, it's the emotional exclamation point of that show. I did find two things interesting. Um one is that they filmed this in two parts. They decided that it was just too lo uh, it was too long. They needed to break it up, and they didn't announce it as part one of part two. Now that could be because of the whole maybe Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning thing doing part one, but then also you had like years ago Divergent Part One, which or Surgent or Insert, whatever the hell that show that one. They never did release part two. Then there's you know there's a few other like uh, Hunger Games Part One did better than hunger games part two ending kind of thing. So I kind of wonder if maybe a little bit of that kind of like, well, let them be surprised when, when we cut off in the middle of the, <laughs> the middle of the story here. <laughs> I, I have a feeling they're going to cut it off after defying gravity. Mm. That's the big act one ender, right? Yes. But that's where I'm very iffy on the decision to cut this into two parts. Cause I think the stage play, even with intermission is like two and a half hours. I think the actual runtime is maybe two hours, maybe two hours and 15 minutes. It's not that long, especially the second act. The second act, I think, is only 45 minutes, maybe an hour. It's kind of like the Les Mis thing where um, Les Mis is like the first act is probably has the best known songs. It's about maybe like 2.15. Then you have the 15 minute intermission and then the act two is like 45 minutes is brisk. You yeah. really only have empty chairs, empty tables. You know, that's the big <laughs> sucker punch. You know, the big, the big yeah. emotional punch for that one after, of course, you know, they build the wall. My problem with this trailer, alongside the fact that they are hiding the part one again, 
uh, which, like you said, is probably reactionary to Mission Impossible bombing at the box office, is the fact that they are, again, not showcasing that this is a musical. Mm. They are trying to they're leaning into it a little bit because you have the the musical stuff in the background. I think it opens with the something has changed mm-hmm. within me. And then it ends with, I'm not a musical person I, I, in terms of like knowing how to structure and compose and whatever. I like musicals. I will go to my grave loving musicals, but the, the big vocalization, the ho, ah, mm-hmm. that part that's the very end of defying gravity. Yeah. And it, it, it like in the moment that is the punctuation of that song. That's not the part that you put at the very end of your trailer. <laughs> in my opinion, it means nothing to no one who doesn't know those songs. Yeah. And it's not a hook. So you, I think you need to start with the, something has changed within me and you need to build into the defying gravity chorus. And maybe you, you can still end with the ha wow vocalization, but you need to keep that defying gravity building up and you need to hear that defying gravity a couple of times because you need people to be like, I've heard that. I know that. Yeah. And the 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 trailer does none of that. And from what I remember, it's a lot of really good visuals that look kind of like Oz the Great and Powerful uh, from Sam Raimi, but also used to get still get a lot of wizard of oz imagery you've got glinda in the bubble and whatnot and ariana grande looks great as glinda i'm very excited to see her portrayal Mm -hmm. but most people should know wicked is a musical and if you're adapting it show us a music sequence (laughs) that was part of the problem i had with west side story from steven spielberg they were so afraid to show us the music and i don't know if that's just because no one wanted to see ansel elgort's stupid face (laughs) well they also did that with you know mean girls the musical they didn't really show any music from that it's did did you speaking of mean girls which i think that's a universal property as well the um this is being put out by universe mm-hmm. wicked is being put out by universal but did you hear the universal ceo's explanation as to why they didn't advertise mean girls as a musical no they didn't want to alienate general audiences because some people don't like musicals <laughs> so they're gonna bait and switch them <laughs> they're not gonna advertise it as a musical and then once they get their money they're gonna be like gotcha fucker <laughs> and you're in a musical now Oh, okay. So, um, my second question, an interpretation, obviously, if you go off in the original MGM kind of wizard of Oz, the wizard is kind of like a down on his luck kind of guy who just kind of stumbled there or, um, Oz, the great and powerful kind of did that too. But it seems that they're playing up that the wizard of Oz is actually a sinister fuck. You hire Jeff Goldblum. I think that's great casting because people are the idea is he's endearing the first time you meet him because he's got this really jazzy song like that's called wonderful and like I am wonderful they say I'm wonderful and it's it's really catchy and I think that's uh, a moment in the play where Glinda is like enthralled by him because yeah. he, he's a con man yeah the idea is he's just getting by on his ability to make people feel good about themselves and in this scenario, I think that's a good heel turn with Jeff Goldblum, where he eventually is like, we need to kill this bitch because she's <laughs> going to reveal that I'm awful. OK, because, I mean, he can be sinister. I mean, uh, his famous, well, kind of like un- unknown because he's li- he's his role is freak. Number one is in Death Wish. You know, the Charles uh, Charles Bronson revenge flicks, and he's one of the bad guys. But over the past, like, uh, not even 20, 30-ish years or so, he's just kind of been, he's himself. He's charming. You know, as the Grand Master, he's supposed to be a bad guy gooing people to death with that rod, and yet it's still him. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he's he's just like, oh, wasn't expecting that. My goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Or the, well, there. There it is. (laughs) All right. But I'm I'm looking forward to it. I know Ricky's looking forward to it. I don't like that it's a two parter. I feel like they're just trying to milk it and expand on a story that doesn't need to be expanded on. I was I was certain this was a Warner Brothers property because I think Warner Brothers owns the rights to the original Wizard of Oz. And so I was pretty sure that um the Warner Brothers was the one behind this. Like, of course they're doing a part one of two because that's what they do. But no, this is universal, which again explains why they're hiding that it's a musical. 
Yep. But I I think if the trailer was enough to get people interested, they'll do their research, especially since they have till November to find it. And they'll be like, oh, it's a musical. Um, no, thank you. But hopefully <laughs> I, I'm I'm hopeful that it, it will do well enough that it'll pull a, a greatest showman and do well enough that the sequel. I, I hope they already filmed the yeah, sequel. They, did. they filmed it back to back. OK. Which, again, just make it one damn movie. I don't care if it's two hours and 30 minutes, but just just make release it as one. You don't <laughs> need it as two. So the next trailer is if. And I will say that this trailer pissed me off because they already released it a few days back. They have the great office joke of having Randall Park say he's John Krasinski. That little bit is like 30 to 45 seconds of the trailer. When you watch it online, it did not work for me as a 30 second little smash thing in the Super Bowl of like, hi, I'm John Krasinski. And he goes, no, you're not. And then cut to the trailer. (laughs) <laughs> you need to do what uh i think it was iron man 3 where they did a a thing where there is like an extended look at iron man 3 and it was just 30 seconds of them panning around robert downey jr staring into the camera exactly and in the final like three seconds he takes off his glasses and he goes how's that for an extended look <laughs> they it, just do 30 seconds of ryan reynolds being like you're not john mm-hmm. you're randall park and Randall Park just doing the Asian gym bit from the office. Exactly. Like I, I, I think that would have been absolutely fine. And then you do a couple of quick shots of the movie, but it's, I think the movie looks charming enough that you don't need those sort of internet memes as well. Yeah. I, I think it's funny that they're leaning into it, but that could have just been a bonus thing for people watching on YouTube. Yeah. Cause you need to part of this movie. It, it looks charming as hell but they don't seem to be leaning into that. They they're leaning more into, we've got Ryan Reynolds. We've got John Krasinski who are hilarious people. And we've got a, a cast full of hilarious people. Watch us do behind the scenes antics. Don't worry about the product that's on screen. And that's a little concerning. Yeah. You have Steve Carell. Who's also from the office. He's the main blue, which I will say it's mostly his voice, but he's doing it very charmingly. It's very sincere and lovable. He's very excited. Michael Scott. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great. You have all of these other, you know, names for all the imaginary characters, which I understand is probably, um, is probably being held back just because they really want to focus at, you know, Ryan Reynolds is the star. And then you have Steve Carell and John Krasinski. He's doing this instead of a quiet place prequel. So you're, we're going to lean into this, you know, but I I didn't feel that this mashup of the trailer and this whole, like, as you said, the behind the scenes bit worked. The first trailer we got like two months ago worked so well. It, it gave me the warm fuzzies of like, Oh yeah. I remember being young and what if imaginary friends were real? And you know, this one was just like, I was, distracted by the not joke that doesn't have context and then oh yeah we're we're doing voices yeah it's a very niche meme that they're aping for this trailer and it only works with the internet crowd yeah the general audiences are not going to understand that joke especially when the last time they watched the office was years ago yeah not everyone is streaming the office on Peacock or whatever else streaming service it might be on <laughs> constantly to remember the John Krasinski joke. So the next trailer that we are talking about, you need to explain to me whether or not this is a sequel or a reboot, because there's so much going on that feels like it's also, is it, is it a bad guy movie? Like what the hell is happening in twisters? Thank you. Okay. So the original twisters, is, Twister. Sorry, sir. Original Twister. Fantastic movie. You got Laura Dunn, Pill Paxton, script by Michael Crichton. And uh, isn't it Helen Hunt or? Uh, oh, you're Joey right. It's Foster. Helen Hunt. Sorry. Not Laura Dern. Uh, and in the 90s, they may, they may as well be interchangeable. <laughs> and of course, you had Carrie Ells as the bad guy because it was about like uh, Bill Paxton and uh, and Helen Hunt getting commercialized into that hot, hot storm chaser business. Yeah, that storm chaser <laughs> money, baby. Such a lucrative business opportunity. Yeah. And they're chasing down because she has this. They had this device they created together called Dorothy, so they could like upload these things put that could be sucked into the into the twister and give data. So Alex, we, can we missed them. a trick. Oh shit! 
we talked about Wicked. We should have gone into, into Twister. Twister. <laughs> <laughs> it was a one-off. It was a huge hit. It still airs well. It has that meme of, you there know. There was a cow? Yeah, cow. But they keep saying that it wasn't going to be a sequel. And then they, anyone that was in it, they that was supposed to be in it, they kind of cut out because they were not. They don't want to do the Lego cool thing, but they're not saying it's a direct sequel. But they don't want to do a remake. But they're also saying it's not a reboot. But I'm looking at this thing going, and immediately I see Glenn Powell, and I last I saw him, he was from Top Gun, and I went bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> but then the people, the sponsored people, show up with their sleek cars and drones, and I'm like. Oh, so it is like the underdog versus the corporate again. And then they roll out the Dorothy machine with the exact same tech of of the original one. But he says, so any luck destroying that tornado? I'm like, what? So instead of learning how to map tornadoes, it sounds like they're just trying to end tornadoes. Because tornadoes are vindictive (laughs) natural disasters that are intentionally going after this one person. And the thing about it is that bothers me so much about that statement, which if that's what the movie's about, like this tech that can like end tornadoes, maybe they're saying, hey, listen, when we get data, we can like know how to like do things around the area to like stop it. Maybe turn the wind farms the other direction or some shit. I don't know. But all I hear is <laughs> Sharknado and the end of Sharknado where they literally destroy it tornadoes by throwing propane tanks and blowing them up inside of the (laughs) tornadoes so that's all i can think of it's like dude they're gonna spend 250 million dollars to make sharknado this is great (laughs) i i don't have a whole lot to say about twisters i know a lot of people were excited about this i have a friend from way back in the day where twister was like her favorite movie Mm mm-hmm I think it's it's a quaint little movie, and unfortunately, Bill Paxton can't come back for a cameo mm. for obvious reasons. But the novelty of this is gone. Yeah. We have been so desensitized to disaster movies that what is this trailer? Because the narrative they're putting out there is corporate bad guys, and we're going to destroy tornadoes. You could do you could destroy the corporate bad guys <laughs> with the help of the tornadoes. Well, that happened in the first one. But you <laughs> you can't destroy the tornadoes. I'm sorry. The premise here that you're giving me, besides the novelty of this person's about to get sucked away. And how many people fucking died in this trailer? A like, they lot. gave away so many deaths. A lot of people died. Like, they're stuck in like a... <laughs> they're stuck in like a, a, ho- a hotel, a high school gym, and they just open the door. And they're like, oh, uh... The tornado's here. Like, <laughs> shut the fucking door. Yeah, it's like that meme. Like, it's a bit windy out here. You know, the hair blown back kind of thing. The little, the little Arctic fox with the hair blown back. bit windy. But I, I don't know what I don't because the first one, like, yes, it starts off with the lead uh, with Helen Hunts as a young woman. The, the twister hitting her house and like it sucked her father away. And that's why she wants to go after it. And, it, and then it almost kills like her aunt or whatever this new one but i i don't know what the what what is this premise because i i'm i'm sorry glenn powell i <laughs> you're a good actor you were good in maverick but you if you smile and put on sunglasses i immediately go you're the bad guy and i'm cheering for the corporate <laughs> like, well, and that's another thing that's happening in this trailer is it looks like they're trying to create like an amalgamation of the uh, bill paxton and carrie elwes character yeah. Where eventually he's he's going to have a face turn maybe and they're going to team up and do he, he's going to realize the benefit of low tech instead of high tech. I don't know. Be, like who's sending a drone into a tornado? I, that thing's going to get shredded. <laughs> Unless they do the lift thing where they just like cover it in panels, but then it's going to be too heavy to fucking fly. <laughs> All I know is there two things need to distinctly happen in this movie for me to at least admire it. Cow. Yes. One is they got to go cow. And then they go, of course, you got to follow it up with another cow. I think that was the same cow. (laughs) And they have to drive through a house that crashes in front of them. (laughs) It's just a big car commercial. Oh, yeah. I swear 40% of that trailer was just the back end of trucks and making sure we knew it was a Dodge Ram or whatever it is. Oh, yeah. Dodge Ram, not a sponsor, but could be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We could use a Dodge Ram. (laughs) I don't know. Uh, I'm a Chevy guy. (laughs) But if it's free, I'm an anything guy. 
<laughs> That's fair. Free always tastes better. Why am I eating a truck? <laughs> uh, enough of that crap. The movie's going to be horrible. <laughs> so, Alex. Yes. If we're making a dystopian movie, mm-hmm. what is one catchphrase that needs to be in that dystopian movie? Dystopian movie. Mm, I'm going to guess with we're out of water. <laughs> <laughs> close it's what a lovely day oh what a lovely seems to be the new catchphrase for dystopian movies Mm -hmm. or in a world like this (laughs) we we hear it several times in the planet of the apes trailer i forget the name of it is it the kingdom of the planet of the apes what's the name of this one now kingdom of the planet of the apes which i still need to go back and watch the like andy circus quadrilogy or whatever it is that they did with uh, matt reeves for most of those movies it's just something that they seem like they're they're good movies, but they premise themselves on being action movies. But I know they're not. Oh, yeah. No, there there's some action sequences, but they're more drama. And I, I just. The time involvement for something that needs my my undivided attention like that is because I, I want to appreciate it. it. It's more than I have right now with three kids being in school and constantly being sick. This is kicking off a new set of tr- movies, and I don't think that any prior knowledge is needed for this one. Other than the fact that I I believe that there's like a disease that has taken away humans ability to speak, or at least most humans ability to speak. I I have vague memories of the first original, you know, um, not Charles Bronson. What the heck is his name? Charlton Heston. Charlton Heston. Thank you. Of his of the original series, of course, you know, God damn it. You destroyed it all. Get your hands off me. Damn. Those are just cultural lexicon. I watched Rise of the Planet of the Apes where they kind of did something you know similar, but they turn the phrase of get your hand off of me you damn well you damn dirty human or whatever in that i i think i saw dawn but i didn't watch war it, it just it, there are dramas there's obviously you know some cultural um some cultural metaphors that they're exploring with this they just didn't grip me very well but they all look very samey too like yes I've said this about the Ma- uh, Mass Effect Mission Impossible movies, where once you get, I think once you get to like Mission Impossible Five, I think Ghost Protocol is pretty memorable because you've mm-hmm. got climbing the skyscraper in Dubai. Uh, but once you go four through seven, they all feel pretty similar. Yeah, and this one, the thing that bothered me about the trailer for this one is it reminded me too much of what is it like it came out maybe like 10, 15 years ago, like 3000 AD or something like that of 10,000 BC. Yeah. Maybe that was, yeah. T- the three, like 10,000 BC where the first human you see, of course, is like, it's a very pretty blue eyed, uh, blue eyed girl. Who's kind of dirty and mussy, but obviously is the love interest of something. And I'm like, that movie broke my brain. I saw that <laughs> and I reviewed it for that. That came out in like 2007 or 2008. And I, I distinctly remember because I did a review for our, our school newspaper and talking smack. Matt was the entertainment editor at the time. And he put in a placeholder uh, for a caption for the the picture that we used. Yeah. And it just said 10,000 BC is a piece of shit movie. That's going to go <laughs> into a junk pile in 10 years. And he forgot to remove it. And so we published with that, that editorial. I don't know if this is a continuation is it like a Camilla leap? Bell was in that. That's it. Yeah. That, and she, oh my God, this, I got it. I, sorry, you, you opened the floodgates here. <laughs> so this movie is set. 10,000 BC is set in like prehistoric Siberia. Mm-hmm. And it eventually moves down into Egypt where they're building the pyramids. <laughs> and there's and mammoths com- and like jagu- and like a uh, saber tooth tigers. Right? Yeah. So the pyramids were built during the ice age. Apparently. Why not? I don't know, but it's, it's such a it's one of the worst movies I've ever seen. <laughs> OK, so this is apparently 300 years after Caesar's time. So after the last trilogy. Because we can't afford to keep spending money on Andy Serkis and him not getting an Oscar. How much do you want to bet that after this trilogy, they start like bumping up to the Charlton Heston movies? Because that's what they did is they went back. So you think they're kind of like edging forward eventually so they can recast him with Marky Mark again? <laughs> uh, I'm, that's the idea with all of these right is that you're you're eventually building up to a point where you can either end this series with like and here's where the charlton heston story begins yeah you think or you just go into it and you recreate 
and remake that story, mm-hmm. which I think that's fine. I think using real, uh, not real, modern CGI effects, especially with the the love and care that they put into these movies to make the apes and everyone look so good. They look gorgeous. How I, Have these movies won best visual effects or do they just continue to get undermined by other things that don't deserve it? I don't even know. I think they get nominated but don't win because then there's that whole argument of are the apes performances the actors or is it digital effects? I know that's been. But then, I mean, why does Gollum win for best visual effects? Like you can't mm. make that argument and award Lord of the Rings for it as well, because someone still has to animate over that motion capture because sometimes they, they don't match up one to one just because there's a motion capture doesn't mean that the animators aren't doing work and taking liberties on things. No, I completely agree. I think it's really in that kind of uh, sense. It's really a partnership. Yeah. And that's, that's a damn shame, especially considering like Andy circus needs an honorary Oscar at this point, like with the way Hollywood is getting off unexpectedly lately, Mm -hmm. they need to give him an award sooner rather than later, even if it's an honorary award. Are we, are we at the big one, Josh? The time we are at the big one. I think it's time to to start winding this down because uh, the the Internet has said the the MCU is back. But I I would disagree because the MCU is still fun. Go back and watch the Marvels. It's on Disney Plus now. It's, Disney it's, Plus, not a sponsor. Could be Josh, Josh. Marvel Jesus is finally here to save us. <laughs> <laughs> The only joke of the well, Deadpool has hair. That's the other joke <laughs> of this trailer. Everything else is very straightforward. I don't know. Saying that Disney's about to get pegged is pretty not necessarily straightforward. That's a full on like fuck you. <laughs> fair, fair. Uh, I, I was shocked that they just went straight DVA uh, TVA. Mm-hmm. We're the TVA. You're getting recruited into this because you, we need you to be Marvel Jesus, <laughs> but. Oh, yeah. I was more hoping that this is going to be adapting Deadpool kills the Marvel universe, but in a sense of like, maybe somehow Wade has become aware of the Disney Fox merger. And he's like, I got to save myself. And so he just like goes and murders as much of the the bad Fox stuff as he could. But I'm, I'm still very much interested in this one just to see what they do. And we get a little tease of Wolverine patch. Okay. Which if you're unfamiliar with Wolverine patch, yes, please explain it that. is the, it is the dumbest shit in the world, but it's hilarious. And it's amazing that they're pulling this from the comics. So I can't remember if Wolverine like creates an alternate personality or if it's just like an undercover role, but there's uh, this alternate personality that Wolverine creates called patch, which is literally just him wearing an eye patch in a white tuxedo suit. <laughs> so that's the him at the poker table. Yes. <laughs> It'll be Hugh Jackman in a white tuxedo <laughs> suit with an eye patch as Wolverine. He's got the he's got the the wavy hair, and that that's it. Like I I don't know much more about Patch. Like I said, I can't remember if it's an alternate personality that he creates uh, after he like comes back from the dead or something, or he loses his memory and he's like I'm Patch, bub, um, or if it's more like um, Batman's Matches Malone, where he's like undercover and he's like no one will recognize me with an eye patch and a white tuxedo suit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which if if you if you love the idea of patch look up joe fix it as well oh oh i'm googling joe fix it <laughs> oh my god the gray hulk that is right <laughs> it's i forgot about it's this the gray hulk in suspenders and a button-down shirt he he, he basically looks like a 1920s mobster bouncer. <laughs> uh okay so Trailer starts off saying it's been a rough few years, which as Marvel fans will test a little bit. Uh, but Shatterstar is there. There you have Peter. You have uh, Negasonic. You have Yukio, and some of the, uh, the uh, some of the other people from the bar, and they're doing a birthday party for him. That wig is atrocious, and I am. Oh yeah, I was, that, <laughs> that was it was that was great because I'm just like what are we doing here yeah. <laughs> and i love that they rip it off his head they show them stomping on it as they go through the tv thing but i love that his interview which is probably the longest hold on there's all these little either he stapled it little to his patches. head <laughs> <laughs> or like magnetic attachments or something because there's like little metal and 
Yep. I, I you know, I've talked about it ad nauseum that the, to me, my enjoyment of the MCU is really right on this movie. But it looks like they've given him free reign. And to me, it looks like it's not going to be a smaller movie necessarily than than the second movie because he said, I want to go a little bit smaller. But if he's allowed to do a recalibration and, you know, bringing Deadpool in by I don't even know why the hell he's fighting the TVA after apparently agreeing to be, you know, Marvel Jesus. But. OK, I, I'm kind of so late. The action looked fun. He you know, they pulled a little bit more from the first one with some slow mo with him screaming, wait, the gunplay that he should be doing and stuff. All right, let's see what the actual storyline is, because I don't know what the fuck the storyline is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, from what I understand um, from certain things that have leaked, which, again, minor spoilers for this movie, I believe. Um, but one of the things that he decides he needs to do is find the best Wolverine. The best. <laughs> and that's where we get the guy in the yellow suit. Um, I'm not entirely sure what else is going on in this trailer or what else is going on in the story. I think obviously the the TVA is going to end up becoming the bad guy. Yeah, uh, that seems the most logical conclusion. Or maybe maybe something else happens within there. I don't know. Um, but it's a very fun trailer for what you would expect Deadpool to be in the MCU. I believe they do drop one F bomb in the online trailer. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're really cool action sequences. It's mostly gunplay. We don't get to see a lot of him with his katanas, but the, I was surprised at the lack of giving general audiences the look at Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. Yeah. Because again, people are going Internet people, fans are going to know that Wolverine is in this movie and that he wears a yellow and blue suit in the comics. General audiences, they're going to see the the snicket of the, <laughs> the claws in the shadow. But I think that's not enough for general audiences. They're going to forget that in a second. Yeah, especially with like five Jeff Goldblum ads going on and Jesus spending 14 million dollars to have three different commercials in the Super Bowl <laughs> and there, there's a bunch of different stuff happening that that's a big problem with a lot of these modern Super Bowl trailers is that studios are not willing to spend 14, 20 million dollars for a 90, a, a 60 to 90 second TV spot right. anymore. They'll, they'll do a 15 to 30 second spot and it's like full trailer online. Yeah, that I, and I just like heavily. that bit from business sense. Fine, I get it, but if you're trying to appeal to general audiences, you need to give them a little bit more. And I think that Deadpool trailer is almost what general audiences needed, but I think you needed one shot of Hugh Jackman. Yeah. As Wolverine in that suit. I think so too. And it, like a clear enough shot. Now I will say the thing that slightly ticked me off about going online to find the trailers. So where do you go? You go to YouTube. I immediately went to YouTube to Marvel to Marvel's official YouTube, it's not there. I refreshed like six, seven times. And then I went, wait a second. Ryan Reynolds always dumps his trailer, the trailers first on his YouTube channel. And sure enough, it's there. It already has like 50 K views, even though it's been a minute and a half. <laughs> and so that's where I found it. Oh, to have that kind of influence. Oh, if only. Now you did mention kind of like, you know, Jesus spent like $14 million for three trailers. Um, are you talking about Marvel Jesus? Because there was a Wrexham <laughs> trailer in there <laughs> with an alcohol ad with Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm referring to the the washing of the feet, which I was waiting for some kind of hook on that to be like, vote for the oh my like, God. I, I, <laughs> the, like those those commercials are cringe. But as someone who is a church going person of the, the Christian faith, I'm like, OK, yeah, no. That's fine. I think we could have done a little better with the imagery. It really felt like a generalization of like, hey, this woman looks like a Karen, but she's washing this black person's feet. How could she be racist? And I, I it, it felt gross, especially considering the fact that like, oh, if you're a church with 14 million dollars to spend on a, a Super Bowl commercial, maybe you should have put that into your community. I will say that actually I liked the message. I like the idea of it. Mostly because people do, or a lot of mega churches and local churches 
do tend to forget the message that you know Jesus was giving, which is he it's a humbling act to wash somebody else's feet. Yeah. It is, you know, you're entering the household, taking off the, you know, in the olden days and pick, taking off the sandals, cleaning the feet of them and stuff like that. But also there is stories of the apostles looking to find him. And what is he doing? He's hanging out with, with, you know, the down and out. Hookers, tax collectors. Tax collectors, prostitutes and stuff like that. And, you know, the one time that he went to church, he beat up a bunch of people while he was there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've turned my father's house into a den of iniquity and gambling and kind of thing. And he was attacking the people doing that, not attacking the people mm-hmm. going. And so yeah. I, I do like the message, but it does rub me the wrong way, man. If you're going to spend $14 million, I sure as hell hope that you were also spending like 80 in your local community. You would hope so, but probably not. They just want to drive people over to their website but uh that's that's josh and alex talk religion for (laughs) the first and only time on talking smack now we'll go back to my other religion that's pyro (laughs) yeah seriously there's so many easter eggs and i didn't even realize pyro was in there but cool i'm i'm here for a bunch of nostalgia (laughs) and saying goodbye to the fox universe before deadpool brings it all into apparently there's also a secret wars uh reference in there uh my guy over at uh the wednesday polis posted something that showed that there's a shot where deadpool's laying back and there's a just like buried in the sand uh issue of secret wars number three or something like that yeah it's it's in the it's in the last section where wolverine's walking up to him while he's laying there upper left hand corner secret wars number five which i was going to ask you what the hell is secret wars number five and why do i care I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what the the context of that issue is. I'm wondering if this isn't an allusion to building towards Secret Wars, because the idea of Secret Wars, especially the 2015 edition, is that Doctor Doom creates this, uh, which, oh, my God, how amazing would it be if Deadpool is the introduction to Doctor Doom? Please. Yes, please. Doctor Doom creates this amalgamation of like the multiverse into a, a world called battle world where there's like different districts and areas uh, and continents that are like Marvel zombies. And it, it's this whole just mess of a world that Dr. Doom is holding together with duct tape and bubble gum. And uh, it, it's the, the story is really good. Some of the spinoffs are even better <laughs> because uh there's a, a spinoff. I've talked about it before called Thor's. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Where it's just a police force of Thor's. So there's like a Thor uh, that's a, that's Storm, um, Aurora Monroe. There's a Thor that's Groot. There's a Gwen Stacy that's Gro- uh, Thor. You've got classic Thor. You've got uh, old man Thor, who's the grumpy old police captain. It, it's just it's awesome. I, I love that miniseries from Jason Aaron so much. It also gave us the first A-Force arc, which uh introduced us to oh geez what the heck's her name i'm forgetting we edit that part out <laughs> uh but it, it we get the first a force arc which leads into another one uh singularity that's her name you can leave it in <laughs> <laughs> uh singularity who is just absolutely adorable um and it, it it's i'm curious as to what that easter egg means if it's not foreshadowing going forward or if it's saying that like this 20th century fox wasteland that we're in is part of battle world and maybe this is taking place during the events of Secret Wars, which explains like why Deadpool's not in Secret Wars. Well, um, I don't know, but I think that might be an interesting concept, especially considering Secret Wars is like five years away still. Yeah, like because they are on for a large portion of the action where he's fighting the, the TVA and and apparently a version of Wolverine. It's on like some desert area. So, maybe? yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if that's not just like the amalgamation of the Fox marvel universe yeah. that they just chucked into battle world mm. um but what the conflict is of this movie i don't know i don't care i'm here for witty action f-bombs and uh hugh jackman slashing ryan reynolds into pieces hell yeah um i do love that they're they're going kayfabe with a lot of this stuff too because like immediately after the trailer dropped uh hugh jackman posted a a modified version of the the title card that said wolverine and the asshole <laughs> He's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, we need to figure out what kind of sweepstakes do we want to do? Because Joey from the Game Club pod gifted me a 
Steam copy of Marvel Midnight Suns, which is a game I'm not interested in playing. It's a I believe it's a card based game and it's not like it's the strategy behind it is too eh for me. So I was thinking like anyone who throws us a new suggestion for talking Smackdown, uh, we'll enter them into a, a, a spin mm-hmm. and we'll do the spin at the, the next talking Smackdown episode. Um, unless you got another idea. See, I thought you wanted me to come up with a gift. So I was thinking that we fly them out here to the, uh, the, the talking smack studio. Uh, they have to, of course, pass the background check with, uh, with all of our security team. But since we already have the gift and, you know, I will cancel that first class round, uh, round trip ticket. I like that. I like the idea of, you know, if you can come up with the showstopper smackdown. And it has to be a unique one. Yes. You can't just go like Superman versus Goku. No, no, no. One, we've already done it. And two, everyone talks about that one. Come up with a really good one. Yeah, something unexpected. Like if we... For, yeah. for an example, I, I have a, a list of ones we've got here. So like I one of them that I have here is the unbeatable squirrel girl versus one punch man. Ooh, that's interesting. Oh, Flynn Rider from Tangled versus the Dread Pirate Roberts. Uh, Wesley edition. I mean, even something a little more esoteric, like Jurassic Universe is being it is looking for a director. Which two directors should fight to the friendship or death to direct it? <laughs> and we have to argue about why they're the better one. That could be good. Something like yeah. that. So you can email us at tsmackpot at gmail.com with your suggestions and uh, you can just use the headline uh, sweepstakes uh, subject line or you can tweet at us or use the hashtag talking smackdowns S-M-A-C-D-O-W-N-S uh, and I will I'll try and create like a specific feed up the cats arrived uh, <laughs> sorry if you hear extra meows in the background yeah we'll do that as a, a sweepstakes because we have a talking smackdowns coming up jingle jangle shaking his head <laughs> hi quinn say hi hi quinn <laughs> oh i heard that that was adorable <laughs> boost it when uh when you do the edit so yeah that, that'll be our sweepstakes and we'll do the spin for winner uh during our next talking smackdowns recording so again email us you can use the subject line sweepstakes and submit any any fight suggestions and it, it's not going to be who's the best because that's very uh subjective <laughs> subjective yes thank you we'll just put you in the wheel of names and we'll spin the wheel of names and then you can win a steam copy of marvel midnight suns and you will hear that as we're spinning the names we will be going wheel of morality turn 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 what is the lesson that we should learn (laughs) and it'll be john (laughs) schmann that is our lesson for the week all right alex let's get out of here and call it a day let everyone know about our discord please our discord where we have arguments conversations and also post memes is fantastic you can click the link below or join it at tsmackpod at gmail.com and you can follow us on twitter talking uh you can follow us on social media blue sky instagram threads hive social post news facebook youtube tiktok and lonnie's website at talking smack pod Again, email us your thoughts, question, reviews, SmackDown suggestions at tsmackpod at gmail.com. Thank you to Leo Allen for our musical themes, which you're hearing right now. Alex, who did the remix? Usher. He had a little free time after last night. Because <laughs> you want it more. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I know he does the more <laughs> higher song. I, that's all I know. I'm, I am hip. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to Beppo for our original avatars, Retro Ale Studios for our Ricky avatar. Please like, subscribe, rate, review your podcast on your podcatcher of choice. Thank you so much for listening. Next week, we will be back with the movie of the year, Madam Web. Hell yeah. And most importantly, thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your day to listen to this. Take care. Watch Star Wars. Watch it. Exclusively in theaters again on May 25th. <laughs> Star Wars Episode 1 re release, not a sponsor, but could be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, watch Star Trek while you're at it.
Who loves T Smack? I love T Smack. Is it true? Mm hmm. I do, I do. Ooh.